church, let's rise up and worship and open our hearts to Jesus. Say, Lord, my soul says yes. Lord, I'm ready. Let's open our hearts to the Lord this morning and just say, Lord, I say yes. I say yes, mighty God. I respond to your word this morning. I respond to your truth this morning. You are worthy of honor and you are worthy of praise. Yes, my soul says yes. But I open my heart and I say, Lord, let your word enter in and bring light that our lives will never be the same again. We worship you and we bless you this morning. Yes, mighty God, we honor you. We give you our hearts and our minds and our bodies, our spirit, our souls, our wills, mighty God. You take over and take control, mighty Father. We bless you, we bless you, we bless you. There's just such a spirit of worship in this place. Worship the Lord. Just say something to the Lord this morning. No matter how heavy you feel, no matter how sad it might be, just, just worship the Lord. Just declare, Lord, you are good and you are faithful. We honor you and we bless you. We give you glory. Ah, hallelujah. We give you glory, Lord. You are the king of glory indeed. Help us to behold your glory. Even as we partake of the word this morning. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Holy Spirit, we are in submission. Take over and take control. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's give the Lord a round of applause. Oh, yes, our souls say yes. <laughs> we say yes to the will of God. We say yes to the Holy Spirit. We say yes to the plans of God. We surrender. We surrender to the Lord. Oh, he's worthy of honor. He's worthy of praise. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Let us take our seats. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. Moyowak Urie. Hallelujah. My soul says yes. My soul says yes. Even if my body doesn't feel like it, but Lord, my soul says yes. Hallelujah. Uh, we greet you all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We welcome you uh, to this service. Hallelujah. It's good to be in the presence of the Almighty God. We have been learning a lot of things under the tutorship and the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. 
uh, just welcome someone to the house of the Lord by waving at them. Don't hug them. Hallelujah. Just, just wave. Just wave. Hallelujah. Let the social distance work. Hallelujah. And if you're in your, in your home, uh, just greet someone you're with there. Hallelujah. And say, this is the house of the Lord. Amen. We are about to have church. Hallelujah. Though we understand that church is not a building, uh, it's not an activity. We are the church. Hallelujah. And where two or three are gathered in his name, he is there also. Amen. Praise the Lord. So it's good to be in the presence of the Lord. I'm excited about the topics that we are looking at. Hallelujah. They might be the foundational teachings. Amen. But we know they make a difference in our lives. Amen. You know, the kind of foundation that you receive as a person will determine the kind of life that you have. Uh, not just the decisions that you make. It, it will determine any structure, any structure that you want to build, work on the foundation. And so if we are going to enjoy this Christian walk, we need to work on our foundation. Um, the, the sometimes, you know, if you see a building that's not quite right, go and check the foundation. And so if you look at the life of a believer that's not quite right, check their foundation. Amen. It's important to check their foundation. And that's why we visit this every year. Hallelujah. So we can look at our lives. You know, there are things that you're saying, I don't understand why I struggle with these things. I, I don't understand why I'm, I'm, I'm trying to overcome this thing, but I, I cannot. I, I, I seem not to be able to shake it off. Sometimes it's the foundation that you received. Amen. So check your foundation. Amen. And so as we go through this teaching this morning, um, we want to carry on with the four pillars of salvation. Last week, we began to look at the born again process, being born again. And are you born again? Amen. I'm sure it was homework for some of us, hopefully for most of us. It's important to continually check if you are born again. Amen. Because it is critical for you to see the kingdom of God and to enter the kingdom of God. Without it, you cannot enter the kingdom. You cannot see it. We can talk all we want, and you can come close to the kingdom, but not be in the kingdom. Amen. And so it's important that we understand. So this morning, we are going to look at the first pillar. Amen. The first pillar of salvation, uh, which is uh, repentance. Repentance. Last week, we began to look. I quoted two scriptures. We, we mainly spoke from, from the book of John chapter 3. Um, and when Nicodemus goes to Jesus from verse 1, where he goes to Jesus by night and he says, you know what, um, uh, how can a man, uh, 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 there's something different about you. There's something different about you. And if you are born again, one of the marks or the indicators of being born again is that people notice that there's something different about you. The glory of God has come back into your life when you are born again, that, that, that they, there's something about you. There's something that shines. That's what Nicodemus said. They said, you know, there's something about you. We are all teachers of the law. We've all studied the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. We know it back to front. We have been ordained as Pharisees, but tell you what, there's something different about you. Amen. So in, when we are born again, there's something different about, about us. Whether we are teenagers, there's something. Your friends will look at you and say there's something different about you. Whether you're a professional sitting in a boardroom, you know, there's something different about you. There's something about the way that you carry yourself. There's something that when we look at you, we behold the glory. When they looked at Jesus, they said, we beheld his glory. The world, word became flesh and he dwelt among us. While he was dwelling, while he was sitting with us, with us we beheld the glory. Amen. And so that, that is the born again process we began to look at last week. The second scripture that I quoted was from Acts chapter, chapter 2. From verse 38, when Peter, you know, it says these men were cut to the heart after uh, Peter had preached. And then Peter gives the pillars of salvation. He says, uh, they, they asked him, men, what shall we do? Brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. And so the four pillars of salvation we will look at are repentance. We are going to look at baptism. We are going to look at believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And number four, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Absolutely essential in the life of a believer 
And like I mentioned last week, sometimes depending on where we are coming from, we have received one and not everything. Or we have received two and not everything. Yet Peter gives us a formula. He says, hey, for you to be saved, you need to repent. After you have repented, you need to be baptized. And when you are baptized, call on the name of the Lord Jesus. Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then receive the gift of baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so we want to look at those. Because I, I've, seen, I've seen many believers, those who have repented, but they don't have the Holy Spirit. Amen. And then some of them have got the Holy Spirit, but have never been baptized. And so this thing carries on, and it, but it affects our foundation. It does affect the foundation. Because if you have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I wonder how you are doing it. I wonder how you are walking your Christianity. I wonder how you are overcoming. I wonder who's teaching you. Hallelujah. I wonder why the gifts of the Spirit are not manifesting in your life when we have been given the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So we want to look at the foundation. Amen. And any time we get to a place where you know that this has not been done, I have not done this, this is the time and the opportunity to actually say, you know what, I know I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, but I've not repented. So you go and you do your repentance. Hallelujah. This is not something that we just go through the motions. This is something that's preparing us for life. This is something that's causing us to enter into the kingdom of God. Amen. And so today, repentance. Hallelujah. Someone shout repentance. Yes, pillar number one, repentance. Amen. Praise the Lord. Repentance. We are going to read from Luke chapter 5, verse 32. Jesus declares his ministry from the beginning. I know most of us would want to quote Luke chapter 4 and from verse 18 where the spirit of the Lord is upon him to preach the gospel. Amen. But he also at other times while he was teaching and with his disciples, Jesus used to declare his ministry. And one of the things about his ministry was the ministry of repentance. In Luke chapter 5, verse 32, it says, I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. Amen. He was declaring his mission. I have not come for people who are right. I have not come for people who've got it figured out. I have not come for people who are living large and don't need God. I have come for the sinners. Hallelujah. So my mission, I came not for the righteous, but for the sinners to repentance. Amen. So Jesus was not confused. You know, the Pharisees would ask him and, 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 and accuse him and say, look, he's gone to the house of a sinner. That was his mission. You see, the problem in life is if you don't know your mission, you will do anything and everything to please people. But Jesus came for sinners specifically. And I emphasize this because repentance, sometimes we don't see the need for repentance. There are some of us who are saying, I am so good. Hallelujah. I'm good. Uh, you know what? If you are to compare me with everybody else, I'm the better of, of most people. And, and so if you are the better of most people, then maybe Jesus didn't come for you. Jesus came for the sinners. Hallelujah. Someone say sinners. Amen. If you are going to go through the born again process, if you are going to be born again, one of the things that you need to admit is that you are a sinner. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Again, Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 verse 17 says, uh, in Matthew chapter 4 verse 17, it says, from that time, okay, Jesus began to preach. And to say, what did he say? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was the language of Jesus while he was preaching. Repent. Jesus preached repentance. So I am not going to apologize to teach this message. Because it is the message of Jesus. The message of repentance is the message of Jesus Christ. He knew that it is absolutely critical for the human race to repent. Hallelujah. Amen. And you know, the message of repentance is not, an, it's not a light one. Amen. Even before I started to minister this, I said, Lord, help me to minister it with grace. 
Because it's not a light one. When we are talking about sin, hallelujah, we can't afford to be apologetic. We need to deal with sin. We need to tell you to repent. We need to speak into your life. Whoever is leading you, if there is something wrong with what you are doing, you need somebody to tell you to repent. Jesus wasn't interested in filling numbers. A group of, you know, a, a large following of believers. You know, you know, he wasn't interested in just, you know, coming and, and patting their backs and telling them, no, you're okay. Like wh what we do sometimes. Sometimes we don't preach repentance because we want the numbers in the church to increase. But not Jesus. His message was the message of repentance. He said, repent for the kingdom of God is near. In fact, these guys were so serious. Hallelujah. And that's what causes me not to be apologetic. I mean, what at one point in time, John the Baptist says, you, you brood of vipers. Hallelujah. Amen. Who would go to a church where they are called a brood of vipers? Absolutely not. But when John was dealing with him, John the Baptist, dealing with them, he said, you know what? This, his baptism was the baptism of repentance. Do you know that? Amen. <laughs> Uh, not anything else. The baptism of repentance. That's why he spoke very harshly. He was not harsh at the people. He was harsh at the sin. <laughs> we don't hate people. We don't attack people. We attack the sin. Am I talking to somebody? Praise the Lord. And so it says Jesus began to preach, repent, all the time, repent. The apostles, their message was repent. Praise the Lord. Now what is this, what is this woman of God talking about this morning? What is repentance? I'll define it for you. Repentance is turning away from your sins. It's turning to God. It's changing the way that you think and act. Because the kingdom of God requires it. Can I repeat that? It's turning away from your sins. And we'll define sin just now. So you turn away from your sin. You turn to God. So there is a turning. Someone say there is a turning. When you get born again, something changes. Amen. We turn. There must be a change. Hallelujah. So, 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 we turn from our sin. We turn from something. Someone say from something. Into something. <laughs> so, we turn from our sin into God. And then we change the way that we think and act. Because the kingdom of God requires it. Repentance is a requirement of the kingdom of God, not particular churches. Amen. And last week we spoke about the difference of, you know, when it comes to the kingdom, it's not about denominations. It's not about what your church allows. It's about what God allows. Amen. Sometimes we can allow certain things. You know, nowadays it's so fashionable. We can allow certain things in the church. We can, we can work with grace. But there are some things that the kingdom of God will not allow. I can allow them as a pastor, but not the kingdom of God. You can allow them as a parent, but not the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. When you come to the kingdom, it will say repent. Turn from the sin. Turn away from it. Now, what is sin anyway? What is a sinner? Praise the Lord. Amen. So sin, or the sinner is one who has broken the law of God. Amen. Amen. I'm trying to simplify it as much as possible. So sin is breaking the law of God. And then the sinner is the one who does the breaking. Praise God. Hallelujah. The law of God. Whatever God says in his kingdom... If we have broken it, it has made us a sinner. 
And I know sometimes we want to say, you know, there are different types of sins. No. Hallelujah. We even categorize our sins. You know, there are big sins and there are small sins. There are white lies and there are big lies. It was just a white lie. Tell you what, it's a sin. Amen. No, I was just, I was just, I, I was just messing around. <laughs> it's still a sin. And yet you are looking and saying, no, but you know what? I, I, I don't club. I'm not, I'm not in prostitution. I've not stolen someone's husband. And you know, I think those people are the bad people. I've not killed anybody. Uh, but but you, you've been lying, haven't you? Hallelujah. And sometimes I always talk about lying. It almost is like, a <laughs> you know, but let's talk about other things. The other things that we do. Amen. All that comes under the category of sin. Pride. Hallelujah. Amen. So you have people who say, I don't have a problem with lying, but they are so proud. Too proud to say, I'm sorry. Too proud to move out of the way. If you don't move out of the way, then I've got a problem with you. Some of us know it all. Hallelujah. We know it all. No one can tell us anything because of where we are coming from, because of what we have studied. We are elevated. Pride is a sin. But most of us don't believe it is. I mean, how can we put it in the same category as someone who's just bewitched somebody or somebody who's raped somebody? How can they all be the same? It's the same. Sin is the same to God. No white lie can stand in the presence of God. Because God is a just God. He's holy. Praise God. If sin comes into the presence of God, it's going to disappear because it's going to die. The wages of sin is death. If a sinner, if a sinner, catch me, child of God, if a sinner is to come into the presence of the almighty God, all things being equal, he is just. He will meet justice immediately. Not because he has chosen to. That's who he is. That's who he is. Amen. And God in all his understanding knows that sin cannot stand in his presence. Sinners cannot stand in his presence. They cannot partake of the presence of God. So uh, not because he, he wants to harm them, but his nature. <laughs> his nature cannot stand in the presence of sin. Ah, are we talking to someone? Hallelujah. Now, why is this so? The Bible tells us, Romans chapter 6, verse 23. It says that the wages of sin is death. Principle there. The wages of sin is death. If there is sin, we are going to end up in death. So the first sin that is recorded in the Bible, where Adam and Eve transgress the law of God, God gives a law and they break it. They don't listen to it. Hallelujah. Amen. So that's a sin in itself. You know, when God says something and you don't do it, it's a sin. Ah, am I talking to someone? It's a sin. And because it's a sin, the wages of sin is death. Death is separation from God. That's what death is all about. <laughs> when a person dies, the God thing inside of them is what has left them. We are left with the body, isn't it? And that's why the scriptures are telling us that, you know, the wages of sin is death. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All, hallelujah, everybody. Why am I emphasizing this? Because unless you admit that you are a sinner, how are we going to get you saved? <laughs> Amen, hallelujah. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. So even if I just, just, just a little bit, it separates me from God. Hallelujah. But what we are told is that for God so loved the world, God had to make another plan. Amen. God made another plan, but the way he made it was in such a way that he fulfilled 
the righteous requirements of the law. The wages of sin is death. So someone must die. For every law that you break, for there is a sentence or a penalty, isn't it? So if, you, if, if they find you, you are a drunken driver, what are they going to do? I, I, just in the natural, hallelujah. If, if it's drunken driving, they are going to give you a certain sentence because you've been found guilty. Now, if you killed someone while you were drunk, then you get another penalty. Amen. And, and then if you were just speeding, if you were just speeding, they'll give you a traffic ticket or fine, isn't it? And they don't necessarily come to your house, but when you want to renew your license, what's going to happen? They'll get you, isn't it? That's because every transgression has got its penalty. In the case of sin, the penalty of sin is death, full stop, finish and clap. So God in his just nature brought his son, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son. That he will come into the earth and die. That's why Jesus had to die. He was paying the wage for sin. That's why when they looked at him, they said, behold the Lamb of God. Who does what? Who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus was just paying the price. It's like someone who is arrested and taken to, 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 to um, the police station and you spend the night there. They say, you know what, maybe you need to pay, you need, we need to, you, you, someone needs to pay bail for you. For you in order to be what? To be released. Someone must pay the price. They won't release you unless it's paid. Sin was not going to let go of us unless somebody died. And so God, in all his wisdom, releases Jesus Christ, the word who came and dwelt in the earth, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. While he was on the cross, all the sin of the world, all the sin, your sin, my sin, was on him. And remember, when they sin, God cannot be there. And so while he's there, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where there is sin, God cannot remain. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So, so for one time, Jesus says, my father has left. The father didn't leave because he didn't love his son, but he left because the sin was present. And that separation with God brought about the death of Jesus Christ, and Jesus paid the price. He paid the price for you and me. Hallelujah. He was dealing with our sin so that you and I can repent. Hallelujah. So that when we look at him, we say, oh God, did, did, did he really do that for me? Did he really do that for me? Because you were the one who was supposed to be crucified. Amen. Me. Hallelujah. And you're saying crucifixion just for a white lie, yes. Mm. I let myself get carried away, but let's flow with the spirit of God. Amen. So Jesus pays the price so that you can be released. Hallelujah. Now, when you are released, what do you do? If someone were to pay for you, hallelujah, they come and they say, you know what, uh, no, they say, no, this person must spend two weeks in, in the holding cells, and, and, and you're thinking two weeks here, and you're looking at all these weird guys and weird girls, and you're just saying, I wish somebody would pay the price for me. And then you hear that the bail has been paid. Hallelujah. What do you do? Let's talk. Amen. You would be excited, isn't it? Praise the Lord. And you would go, what, what would you do to the person who paid the bail for you? You go and thank him. You see, if it's your father, you know, especially if you were arguing with your father. Hallelujah. You know, sometimes, you know, hey, your parents, you think you're now grown up. You can make your own decisions, and then you find yourself in trouble. 
and your father comes to pay the price or the penalty or the bail. You love your father. That's what repentance is all about. You are saying, Jesus, you paid the price for me. I would have been down and out. I would have been destroyed. My life would have been zero if you had not come. But thank you for paying the price for me so that I can be free. Now, Jesus, since you went into the grave, I must live for you. You died for me so that I can live for you. That's what repentance is all about. Jesus, when you went in, you took the lying, you took the thieving, the stealing, the adultery, so that I can live a life that's not a life of adultery. Oh, come on, somebody. Jesus, you went into the grave. You took abuse. You took everything so that I will live a life, the life that's not of an abuser. Ah, can you see repentance? Repentance is all powerful where God takes away the sin. Once that sin is taken away, you can come into the presence of God. That's why we can come into the presence of the Lord and dance the way we dance and pray the way we pray because God took away the sin. We can decree and declare because Jesus took away the sin. We can declare that we are blessed because Jesus took away the sin. It, I am just as if I've never sinned. Oh, come on, somebody. Somebody paid the price for me. Hallelujah. I'm living my life just as if I never sinned. Oh, I'm approaching the throne of grace just as if I never sinned. I am claiming the promises of God just as if I've never sinned. I was guilty, but the price was paid. We have a lot of believers who are still paying for things that Jesus paid for. Because we don't understand repentance. Uh, Jesus took poverty into the grave so that I can live. I can live in Christ. I can experience the riches of God. Uh, he took sickness. Uh, repentance is, is, is wide. You see, when you take sin away, then even the sickness goes with it. Because before there was any sickness, there was, there was, there was no sin. It's only we hear of sickness and death because of sin. And these sicknesses lead to death. Ah, the wages of sin is death. Now, where is pastor taking this? I said, those who have sinned are those who have transgressed the will of God. And last week, we started talking about even the children in your home need to be saved. Amen. Hallelujah. Those little angels, you know, the angels in your house. Praise God. Amen. I know the ones next door don't look like angels, isn't it? <laughs> but yours, they are angels. You say, oh, my kids. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's always so easy to see that. Lee, so-and-so's kids are out of order. Yours are, they are always perfect. But while they are like that, it says all have sinned. That same sin, we, if we look at Romans chapter 5, it tells us um, in Romans chapter 5, verse 19, it says, just, through the just as through the disobedience of one man, many were made sinners. Hallelujah. The disobedience of Adam made us all sinners. Many were made sinners. So through the obedience of one man, many were made righteous. Hallelujah. Amen. So if I'm going to experience righteousness, I must... Uh, First, accept that I was a sinner. Or I am a sinner. Hallelujah. And my sin must be confessed. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, what does repentance do? Repentance accepts Jesus Christ and the gift that Jesus Christ has done for us. Amen. Number two, it invokes the mercy of God. Hallelujah. The penalty of sin is canceled because Jesus paid the price. Hallelujah. His death paid the wages of sin, therefore we are reconciled with God. Amen. Reconciliation with God. When God, when you come into the presence of God, God doesn't see the sin. What he sees is the righteousness. Because of Christ's obedience, you are righteous. 
You are just as if you never sinned. You can come into the presence of the Lord and do whatever you need to do in the presence of the almighty God. Repentance also, number three, brings fellowship with God. Ah, hallelujah. The sin that used to separate us no longer separates us. That's why we can sit in the presence of the almighty God in your home and just enjoy the presence of God. Wherever you are, while you are driving, you are talking to the Holy Spirit. You could never have done that. Amen. And if you are a sinner, that's why there is no fellowship with the Holy Spirit. You can try and conjure it. Ah, amen. You know, sometimes when things don't work, we put pressure. You can't put pressure in hearing the Holy Spirit. If you're not hearing him, <laughs> then, then we need to go back and see and say, why am I not hearing the Spirit of God? You know, sometimes we start binding things and whatever. There's no binding that's necessary. You just need to be in the place of repentance so that you have fellowship with the Spirit of God. We said it's, what did we say repentance is? Turning away from sin and you are turning to God. Hallelujah. Now, repentance has got fruits. Hallelujah. When you are walking, when you say, you know what, I am now repenting. Thank you, Jesus. You paid the price. I understand that you paid the price for me. I know even now in my state, I might fall. I might do things that are wrong, but you still paid the price for me. So when I do things that are wrong, I run quickly to Jesus. I turn to God and I say, Lord, forgive me for what I did. Amen. I just shouted at so and so. Amen. I just gossiped, amen. I just posted something that I shouldn't have posted. But you, you come to Jesus and, and you confess your sin. But you have turned your back on sin, isn't it? Hallelujah. Now, repentance must always, repentance often always comes with, with change. Amen. We spoke about that. We said to turn. Hallelujah. Now, an example of repentance we're going to read from Luke chapter 19, verse 8. Luke chapter 19, verse 8. We have a man called Zacchaeus. Uh, Jesus decides to go to Zacchaeus' house. He's a tax collector. And he says, you know what, Zacchaeus, I, I, I'm coming to your house. They have a meal together. And while he's with Jesus, he beholds the glory again. Hallelujah. He beholds the glory and, and he's convicted. And now when he's convicted, this is what Zacchaeus says. Zacchaeus stood, amen, hallelujah. There is a change of position. He might have been sitting, but he stood. He said, for this one, I have to stand up, hallelujah. When it comes to repentance, sometimes you have to stand up. There are some situations that you need to come out of. You need to stand up, hallelujah. There are things that will not change until you remain, until you stand up and get out of that place. You are in a relationship that you need to come out of. You need to stand up and get out of that place because God never ordained it. You are sinking in sin. It could be sexual sin. Uh, you know what? You need to stand up. Someone say stand up. Stand up and come out of that situation. No wonder the Bible says, arise and shine. You can't shine while you're sitting down. Change cannot come while you're sitting down. When it comes to this thing called sin, there are things that you need to walk away from. So it says, Zacchaeus stood up ah, and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. If I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. That's repentance. Amen. He begins to list his sins one by one. Of course, he's clever. He's saying, if I, he knew. The thing with sin is we, we, we never want to say that we have sinned. Ah, <laughs> amen. So, so Lord, if I, if I ever gossiped, you just came off the phone. Ah, am I talking to somebody? Lord, if I ever disobeyed you, come now. If I ever disobeyed you, serious. You don't know that you've disobeyed God? Ah, let's talk. <laughs> and, and so, Zacchaeus says, half of my goods, he's making a decision, I am giving to the poor, because he knew the way that he got those goods was not right. He knew it was extortion. He said, I've been cheating these people, but now I want to repent. If you are cheating, repentance calls for you to stop cheating. 
At one point in time, the Apostle Paul says, he who steals should steal no longer. Mm, hallelujah. As a mark of repentance, something must stop. As a born-again believer, you need to say, before I was born again, I used to, one, two, three. But I stopped. Because there are some people who have not stopped anything. Ah, they are born again, but they have not stopped anything. They say, Jesus took me, he received me just as I am. Have you ever heard of that? You know, just as I am, you know, God loves me. I, I'm sinning, God loves me, ah. He loves you, and I don't dispute that. But you need to deal with the sin. Hallelujah. Praise God. There must be something that changed in your life because you repented. If you were sleeping 12 hours, you say, I stopped sleeping 12 hours. Now I sleep six hours. That's repentance. It's change. I used to lie to people to get money out of them. But now I have changed. Someone say change. There's fruit of repentance. Amen. And then listen to what Jesus says. Well, after, after what um, Zacchaeus says, Jesus says, now salvation. <laughs> now salvation. Jesus did not announce that Zacchaeus was saved before he repented. Ah, what does your Bible say? Now salvation has come to this house. Unless we change something, we can't see the salvation of God. You can say, oh no, Jesus is the king of my life. But you are, the way that you are living, the place that you are, is not a place of salvation. But Jesus said, now salvation, now salvation. <laughs> has come to this house. That's verse 9. Praise the Lord. Are we still together? Do we understand this thing? So, 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 when I'm looking at my born again experience, that's why people should say, ah, so and so, we knew them. Eh, before they were saved, before they were, you know, before they were born again. We knew them. Ah, what, what night, what club did not know them? Or, or, or rather, what, what club... <laughs> Oh, now they are closed. <laughs> Praise God. But you know what? Let someone say, before they were born again, they used to have anger issues. But now that they are born again, they are no longer angry. That's a testimony. That is the fruit of repentance. Before they were born again, they used to beat up their wife. But now that they are saved, the wife is, is looking well. She is no longer being abused. These things can be passed to us even culturally, and we think they are okay. But some of them we need to change because some, some cultural, let me touch that. There are certain cultural things that we do in the name of culture that transgress the laws of God. It's sin. I'm born again, but I, I can go to a sangoma. I can go and do the rituals. What rituals are you still doing as a child of God? You have not repented. Hallelujah. Say, so I know in church you are there reading the Bible, but when they say we are having a, a, a traditional thing, you are there. They are tying things around your hands, you are there. When you are also wearing those things, no, repent, repent, repent. Turn away from your sin. Turn away from those cultural practices. Repent. Let them say that before they were born again, he never loved his wife. But look at the way he loves his wife now. We cannot have Christian men and ungodly men all not loving their wives. Amen. And all the wives said amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Don't say it too loud if it's close. Hallelujah. Let the Holy Spirit convict. Amen. I thought I would make you laugh. It's too serious, this topic. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Born again men don't love their wives. 
And yet Jesus said, love your wife. When you don't love your wife, you have broken the law. You are a Let's call it what it is. So that we can get saved. We want people who are born again. We want the fruits of repentance. Before I was born again, I was having children all over the place. And I never looked after them. But now that I'm born again, I know I can't go back into those relationships, but I'll pay maintenance. Mm. Praise God. Is the church still there? Amen. Second Corinthians chapter 7 verse 10 says, For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation. Hallelujah. Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Amen. There must be a godly sorrow that a believer experiences before they experience the joy of salvation. You say, Kati, but why am I like this? There must be a desperation for God. Why do I talk like this? Why am I so bitter like this? Why is it when I open my mouth, I, I just cut people? Not with the word of God, with my own words. I'm in need of God. God, don't leave me in the state. And so the Apostle Paul says, he wrote them a harsh letter. Amen. He wrote the church of Corinth a harsh letter. And then he comes back now to say, you know what? I felt bad about the harshness of my message to you. But I'm glad that when it came to you, it shook you. Because when it shook you, it gave you godly sorrow. I'm glad I made you sad. You know, sometimes I want to make you sad as a pastor. I want to. How many? I want to offend you. So that you experience godly sorrow. <laughs> and when you experience godly sorrow, what happens? It leads to repentance. You see, what has destroyed the church sometimes and our lives as believers is we don't have people, and not even believers, generally. If you surround yourself with people who tell you what you want to hear all the time, they may never be repentant. You may never walk in the things that God is calling you to. Because, because no one is telling you the truth. They must tell you that this thing is not right. If you are not looking, if you are not looking good, someone must tell you. You know, sometimes we say to each other, turn to your neighbor and say you are looking good. And then you turn to the neighbor and, and then you just say it because you are in church. In love. But tell you what, <laughs> tell you what, there's things that we need to speak in love that are going to produce godly sorrow that is going to lead to repentance. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. So, so you know, sometimes when things are not going well in your life, after we have canceled you and whatever, we need to produce some godly sorrow. Hallelujah. Produce godly sorrow in your children. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. So that will lead to repentance. Amen. And, and, and as we are rounding off, um, godly sorrow, as we were talking about godly sorrow, the fruits of repentance is new identity. You are now a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. We won't read there. But if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, all things have passed away. Now you see that new creation thing, most of us are expecting, and I think the deacon uh, spoke about this in the home cell, that, you know, when you come to the front and say, Jesus, come into my heart, you're expecting something to happen. Amen. Goosebumps, you're expecting to fall. You're expecting, I don't know, things that are out of the world. But you know what? You are just, you have a new identity. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And so why wouldn't you want to repent? Hmm? Look at that. You are now the righteousness of God. You are always with God. 
And you know, if you want, for those who want further reading, go and read Romans chapter 5, verse, uh, chapter 5 and Romans chapter 6. It tells you you are no longer a slave to sin. Amen. I've often heard people praying and saying, God, I'm a sinner. Once you have repented, you are no longer a sinner. You are a righteous man. There is a prayer that you can pray as a sinner. But after that, you are a righteous man. Now, this is what happens. The reason why you keep, can I answer why you keep falling into the same sin? Amen. At the back, they're not saying amen. I think they're not interested, but hallelujah. I say it, can I tell you? Ah, oh, no, but you know what? We always assume others are struggling, but perhaps they're not. Hallelujah. Amen. amen. <laughs> so anyway, let me tell those who are struggling. Amen. amen. Praise God. There's an area that you look at and you struggle with. Yeah. And then eventually you say, I think I was born that way. It's my character. You know, I'm, yes, I'm born again. I'm spirit filled. You know, I pray for people. I've been cast out devils, but this one, it's my character. The reason why you do that is because you have not accepted or known that you have a new identity in Christ. You are a new you. Behold, all things are new. Right. Because all things are new. You are no longer a slave to sin. In fact, you are a slave to righteousness. This is what it means. A slave to sin. You say, I can't help it. I must sin. You know when you're a slave, you have no choice. If it's midnight and sin calls, you are going to do it because you are a slave. Somebody say a slave. You see, ah, you know, when you have a slave, you know, you say, go and get me water. They go and get the water. Then you say, this glass is not clean. Go and get another one. Then the slave goes, gets another one. Then you say, ah, it's not cold enough. Go and get another one. The slave can't say, but I've been giving you five glasses of water. A slave has got no option. They go back. And they go back. And they go back. Now, when we are slaves to sin, all sin does is say lie. And before you know it, why are you saying those things? Why are you speaking a lie? Because you are a slave to sin. Then, you know, it starts as one. Just say one small lie. Then you lie. Then, okay, maybe it's to pastor. You say, ah, pastor, you know. Then you say, ah, okay, I'm never going to say it again. <laughs> but then next week, the same issue comes up again. What does sin say? It's a lie. Because you're a slave. A slave, if you just ring the bell, and ting, 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 it's time. You, you react. When the bell of sin rings, the slaves of sin, those who go into adultery, they start adulterating. Those who are fornicating, they start fornicating. Those who are stealing, they start stealing. Those who are lying, they start lying. And that, ah, come on somebody. It's in that place of darkness. Those who abuse wives begin to abuse wives. Why? Because the bell has gone. We are slaves. We are slaves. That's why most of the sins happen in darkness. Because the bell has rang. You don't understand. You know, and sometimes we look and we say, what's wrong with this child? I thought we raised them right. But you know what? When the bell goes, ging, 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 ah, slave is slave. Slave must fulfill. Slaves of righteousness, they go and they do it. And then we say, but what's wrong with our churches? It's not, there's nothing wrong. We just have people who don't understand that God has broken the power of sin over their lives. So the Bible says you are no longer slaves of sin. King, king, king. It means when the bell rings, you have a choice. <laughs> When the bell of sin says, start lying, you say, I choose not to lie. Why? Because you are now a slave to righteousness. Now, I want you to catch this. The slave to righteousness, this is what happens. King, 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 king. All slaves to righteousness rise up and they do what's right.
They start loving their wives. They start submitting to their husbands. They start teaching their children. Why? Because they are slaves to righteousness. When they were supposed to lie, they start telling the truth. Have you ever been in a place where you said, I wanted to lie, but I couldn't? Why? Because I am a slave to righteousness. I can't help being good. That's your new identity. When you were a slave to sin, you, you would be, um, what's the word, stingy. But when you are a slave to righteousness, what are you? You are generous. Am I talking to somebody? I am a slave. When it comes to the things of the kingdom, when I'm born again, I'm a slave to righteousness. You know, there's sometimes I walk and say, no, today, ah, you know, I, I've calculated my finances, everything. Anyone ask me for anything I don't want. But because I'm a slave, it happens. Amen. I say, Eesh, I can't every robot, I'm giving somebody something. Uh -uh. Isn't it? You talk to yourself and you say, I don't do that. But because you're a slave of righteousness, God will just ring his bell. Ding, ding, ding. Ah, and then you say, but this one, I wanted to go to the saloon money. Isn't it? I wanted to use this. God says, you're a slave of righteousness. Bless them. You bless them. And then you meet another situation. Just as you want to fall asleep, then another situation rises. God says, a slave of righteousness, you need to pray. You get up and you pray. Why? I'm a slave to good things. I'm a slave to righteousness. I'm a slave to do the things that God has called me to. And that's why we need slaves of righteousness in government. That's why we need slaves of righteousness in churches. We need ch um, slaves of righteousness in schools. People who can't do anything but good. And that's your new identity in Christ. Let us stand. Let us stand. Let us stand. Repentance. Somebody say turn. Somebody say change. Hallelujah. I'm a slave to righteousness. <laughs> I can't help but be good. Amen. I'm now free from the power of sin. Hallelujah. Praise God. Are we getting it this morning? Are we getting it? It's important that we are in that place of being born again. The four pillars of salvation. I can't live with sin. I must repent. Hallelujah. I must repent. Hallelujah. And so in closing. Have you repented? Have you changed? I want you to see the way heaven reacts when a sinner comes to Christ. It's Luke chapter 15. Jesus talks about three different scenarios. He talks about a lost sheep. He talks about a lost coin. He talks about a lost son. When he came back to his father, he said, I'm sorry. I sinned against you. Forgive me. Repentance is easy. Father, forgive me. I choose to turn. Will I make mistakes along the way? Yes, I will, but at least I've changed direction. When you turn, you are no longer lost. You are finding your way home. Luke chapter 15, verse 10. When the coin was found, the woman said to her neighbors, Rejoice with me. I found the peace that we, the peace which was lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Not one righteous person. God knows where we are. <laughs> 
He knows who we are. It's not a blame game. He's saying, I did something about your sin. I did something about your situation. You're not helpless. Come to me. And it says there's rejoicing in heaven. Rejoicing in heaven when one sinner turns to God. And this message is coming to you because God has been looking for you. If you are there this morning, talk to the Father. Talk to the Father. It's not a church thing. It's a kingdom thing. Hallelujah. No church can qualify you. But God can. We are here to support you. But come back to God. There are things that you need to turn from. He's just waiting. Let us pray this morning. Thank you, Jesus, that you did not come to blame the world. You came to remind us what you did for us. You came to reconcile us to the Father. Indeed, God has loved the world. Thank you for this act of love. May we respond, may we respond, Lord. Not with pride. May we not hide our sin. Because to you, it's, it's right there. It might be hidden from the church. It might be hidden from our families. It might be written, hidden from our loved ones. And we repent of our sin. Someone, there's a private sin. There are private sins. Things that you are doing in the dark. Things you've done in the dark. God is saying repent. That's all you need to do. Just turn from the sin. Come to God. He's not accusing you. There are people you've done things you don't want anyone to ever find out about. You, you've, 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 you've had abortions. You, you've, you've cheated. You have taken things that were not yours. God says turn. He says turn. Turn to me. I'm ready. I'm waiting for you. And some of those things, you need to bring them out. Bring them out so that they lose power. Bring them to God and talk about them and say, God, this is where I am. This is who I am. I can't hide myself. I can't hide what I did. I was guilty, yes, and I am guilty. But today I receive the free gift of life. Forgive me, Lord. Release me, God. Come on, child of God. Release me. I can't die with this. I can't allow this thing to kill me. I want to be free. I want to be free. I want to be free. Father, I pray. Let's raise our hands to the Lord. Let's raise our hands to the Lord. Yes, Jesus. It's for freedom that Christ came into the earth. That you and I can be free. <laughs> Hallelujah. If you repent, you are free and free indeed. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. Enter into the kingdom of God. Enter in with your head held high. Don't apologize for what Jesus did for you on the cross. Hold your head up high. He paid the price. You don't have to pay with your life. You don't have to live in shame. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. This is the born again process. The pillars of salvation. Now salvation must come to your house. Now salvation must come to our homes. Now salvation must come. 
Jesus' mighty name we pray. I'm free indeed. <laughs> oh, you are free indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. This is shouting ground. Hallelujah. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. The penalty is paid for. It is well with my soul. And now I must keep walking towards God. Slow and painful. It may cost me, but I must keep walking. I must keep walking. Someone say, keep walking. Move further and further away from sin. Keep walking. One by one. Step by step. Towards the almighty God. In Jesus' mighty name, God bless you. Hallelujah.